thanks thanks a lot uh, to to Paolo, to Teodoro, and to Luca, and uh, welcome to the Thomas Kahn Center Symposium of, of Machine Learning Application to Chemical Reaction. And as I was saying before, because I can see that there is a lot of people in the audience that are not familiar with the Thomas Young Center. I would like just to say a couple of things that the Thomas Young Center is the London Center for the Theory and Simulation of uh, Materials. It is made up of about 200 research groups from the four uh, main London colleges, Queen Mary, UCL, Imperial, and uh, King's College. And uh, it's probably it's arguably the largest concentration of materials and molecular models in the world. So one of the missions of the Thomas Young Center is to provide a collaborative environment for materials monitors to interact. And therefore we organize several events and uh, such as the one of today. So with this in mind, so last year we decided it was time for the TYC to organize an event on machine learning and with, a, with the application to chemical, to, process, to chemical processes. And we're very lucky that today we have uh, three leading researchers on such a topical subject. So we have Pablo Dral, Teodoro Laino, and uh, Luca Girindelli, Girin, Girindelli, that I would like to thank. So if, if, without further talking, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor uh, Pablo Dral from Xiamma University. Just want to give a very short video. So uh, Pablo is originally from Ukraine, but he did his PhD uh, in Germany at uh, Erlangen Nuremberg University. And then he moved to MPI to work with Walter Thiel. But since 2019, he's an associate professor in theoretical chemistry at Xiamen University, where he, his group develops various machine learning methods to study chemical processing in particular, and how trying to accelerate non-adiabatic static state dynamics. I'd like, to, I'd like, I would like to point out his very nice perspective that he published last year in JFIS Chem Matters, Quantum Chemistry in the Age of Machine Learning, which I will advise you to read. So thanks a lot, Pablo, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks a lot for invitation. So it's very great that so many people joined uh, and I see many uh, familiar uh, names, uh, uh, so very glad uh, uh, that uh, I can share my uh, research here and uh, not just my research, but uh, basically research that we do in collaboration with uh, many people uh, to whom I thank at the end. Uh, so I will talk about quantum chemistry assisted by machine learning. And before this, uh, I will need to introduce Shaman University because uh, it doesn't need introduction in China, uh, but I think it will be helpful for the audience uh, to show a bit more about it. So Shaman is uh, Shaman University uh, is located on a small island uh, here, uh, which uh, is uh, near the Taiwan Strait. And well, as you can see, it's quite far from London, uh, which results in eight hour time difference. Uh, so originally it was called so uh, Soare. So now it's uh, really evening time uh, uh, here. It's uh, 11 p.m. Uh, and uh, on this island, uh, well, this kind of uh, small city by Chinese standards, 2 million people there. Uh, and uh, this year we celebrate 100 year anniversary. Uh, it has some black swans, uh, some very beautiful scenery. Uh, so if you have a chance uh, someday to visit, uh, you are welcome. Uh, so this is uh, just preparation for celebrations. Uh, campus is spruced up with uh, many decorations. Uh, and it's uh, one of the leading uh, uh, universities in uh, China in chemistry. And also globally, it uh, has very nice contributions to chemistry. Uh, so our group uh, focuses on uh, uh, various things. Uh, it's not just machine learning, but also electronic structure calculations and development of uh, uh, quantum chemical methods, semi-empirical methods, basically. and. Uh, uh, since this soiree is about application to chemical reactions, uh, I will probably not talk about uh, uh, really the chemical reactions themselves, uh, but uh, more about the uh, quantum chemistry that is used to, to simulate uh, reactions. Uh, so I was started first my research as a, a kind of computational organic chemist, uh, so that uh, we simulated different reactions. And uh, as uh, you know, for chemical reactions, uh, you uh, have experiment, which is very, 
uh, so which is the cornerstone of uh, investigating these uh, reactions. Uh, but we also need to understand the better simulations or also to uh, explain or maybe even help uh, to plan the synthesis. But uh, here, uh, always we have this uh, intermediate link, which is uh, uh, human. So all our uh, research is, was connected uh, by uh, trying to rationalize uh, experimental finding with simulations and then uh, give it back to experimentalists, but uh, they were somehow disconnected. So now it, it's both of these are uh, very time consuming and uh, also resource consuming. Uh, with machine learning, uh, uh, so we have uh, now a uh, very nice uh, uh, route to improve uh, also experimental design, but this will be talks uh, probably next talks more than mine talk, uh, but you can also improve with machine learning simulations uh, and uh, the basis of simulations, uh, quantum chemical uh, calculations uh, too. That's what I will talk about. And uh, uh, thank you for mentioning this perspective so you can read about it uh, more. Um, I will uh, briefly mention uh, so what is it, it's all about. So in quantum chemistry, uh, yes, you know, it's you, if you solve it, you, you can uh, get answers to uh, basically all your questions, uh, but uh, we cannot solve it uh, for most realistic systems. So we've got lots of approximations that you're all familiar with uh, and uh, the fastest, uh, but the less accurate uh, some empirical methods. And if you more, want more accuracy, generally you need to, to uh, spend more time. Now with machine learning, it's a, a game changer because uh, we can uh, run simulations uh, as fast as molecular mechanics, uh, well, a bit slower, but uh, uh, with accuracy of uh, your most accurate method if you have enough training data. Uh, so this really changes uh, the uh, all the landscape and uh, also you can improve the existing methods. Uh, so it's not uh, just pure machine learning, but you can merge uh, machine learning with uh, quantum chemistry and get much uh, more accurate uh, and uh, uh, methods and uh, improve uh, your predictions. Uh, so in contrast to traditional method development in quantum chemistry that we followed from the inception of uh, quantum chemistry, uh, we needed to develop code, for example, to calculate different properties. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, uh, it, and it's uh, lots of uh, human effort uh, to design mathematical equations, to implement them in computer, uh, run the simulations. It takes lots of time. In principle, machine learning is more generic. So you can take the same code and uh, uh, fit it on the training data. Uh, to predict all these uh, properties that you would uh, painstakingly need to calculate from first principles. Well, here is in principle because in practice uh, you need to adapt it to, to get uh, some reasonable accuracy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there are several ways how you can use machine learning in, uh, to improve uh, uh, or uh, augment uh, quantum chemistry. The easiest way is just to solve Schrodinger equation, generate lots of training data, and then use machine learning to learn this data. Then uh, another way is to improve or uh, change your uh, Hamiltonian, which is possible, for example, in semi-empirical uh, methods. I, I will show you later. Uh, and uh, another fascinating way is to, to predict uh, the uh, wave function uh, itself. Uh, and then uh, even, you know, a wave function, you can again solve the Schrodinger equation and get your properties. Uh, so uh, I will focus now on how we can improve uh, existing methods. So how we can uh, merge uh, machine learning methods with uh, uh, quantum chemical methods, uh, because it's a very generic and powerful approach. And one of the most uh, uh, powerful approaches is uh, this Delta machine learning, because it uh, does not uh, uh, require you to modify the code of quantum chemical uh, method. Uh, pro uh, so you can take this, your favorite program and uh, just use machine learning on top of it. So you can cal calculate properties, uh, calculate it at lower level, uh, and you can predict uh, corrections with machine learning. So this is very intuitive and uh, straightforward approach, easy to implement. And we tested it uh, already in 2000, uh, well, on this data set, uh, uh, which is very popular, QM9. Uh, so if uh, 
you work uh, in machine learning uh, uh, field, you probably know this data set. And we tested uh, this uh, approach of this data set and uh, took uh, various methods. One of them was an empirical PM7 method. Uh, and only by including 1,000 points or 10,000 points uh, uh, in the training set, we can uh, greatly reduce the error distribution uh, so uh, the errors of the uh, these empirical methods uh, and uh, reach uh, uh, almost DFT accuracy, and uh, this uh, improvement in accuracy after training comes for free. So uh, it's very nice approach. Another approach is, uh, as I mentioned before, you can use machine learning to uh, improve some empirical Hamiltonian itself, and uh, this is uh, a completely uh, a different. Uh, Way because you can then predict many uh, uh, other properties. Uh, so uh, if you uh, take these uh, uh, different isomers, uh, you can uh, we, we should demonstrate it on them uh, that uh, uh, you can uh, also get uh, to the accuracy of G4 MP2 level of theory, which is known to have. Uh, uh, error with respect to experiment of one kcal per mole. And this is already close to the topic of this soiree, uh, uh, so that uh, we have uh, uh, isomerization uh, processes, uh, and then we can predict uh, isomerization reactions. Uh, and uh, to use this approach, uh, what we do, uh, uh, we correct uh, semi-empirical parameters with machine learning, and uh, so it's much easier uh, than traditional parameterization. And it's very different from traditional reparameterization because uh, we uh, predict uh, uh, corrections to semi-empirical parameters for each molecule, for each uh, nuclear uh, configuration. And uh, then we use these parameters to solve Schrodinger equation. And then we obtain uh, our final uh, energy uh, and uh, you can also, uh, for example, uh, calculate uh, uh, other uh, properties like uh, dipole moments uh, after you uh, visit uh, correct some empirical parameters. Uh, and uh, when we apply this approach uh, to this uh, uh, data set, uh, so uh, we took in this case uh, OM2 method, uh, some empirical method, uh, and uh, then uh, the error distribution is again much narrower, so uh, the errors are much uh, also much smaller, there are much fewer outliers. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, even better than if you try to take your semi empirical method and uh, reparameterize it on this data set, which is a traditional approach to, to this problem. And another advantage of traditional reparameterization is uh, that. Um, in case of uh, traditional reparameterization, you cannot uh, improve your method uh, indefinitely. So it will uh, hit some uh, plateau at this point. So your training error, your test error, they converge to, to some, uh, to some uh, uh, value. And uh, you cannot really uh, improve uh, beyond this uh, because uh, your model is fixed and you use the same parameters for every nuclear configuration. With machine learning, we don't have this limitation anymore and it can adapt flexibly to any new configuration, any new molecule. And uh, then if you have enough training points, you have a good model, then you can uh, get uh, uh, error much uh, smaller than using traditional reparameterization. Uh, so this was uh, application to improving uh, existing uh, methods, but we can also use machine learning to uh, calculate the properties directly. And uh, this is the cheapest approach computationally. That's what we want to, to do at the end because uh, we want to make it uh, as fast as possible. And uh, this is also possible. It requires uh, usually more data. It's still less generic. Uh, but uh, we can do this. So uh, the most straightforward approach is to to do to learn the uh, potential energy surfaces, uh, which is a, a very popular exercise for machine learning. And there are many methods uh, around for this. I will show our method. Uh, uh, so it was motivated uh, by this uh, nice example. 
uh, done uh, in uh, uh, collaboration with our uh, UCL colleagues uh, in London. So uh, uh, here you can see, uh, uh, so th this is a paper by Yurchenko and uh, Alec, uh, uh, with whom we later uh, recalculated this uh, potential energy surface is machine learning and uh, they are from UCL. And uh, this uh, potential energy surface of, uh, uh, mole uh, of this molecule is important because uh, you can uh, use uh, uh, theoretical calculations uh, to uh, solve uh, uh, nuclear motion problem and then obtain a very accurate uh, uh, raw vibrational spectrum. And uh, for getting this very accurate spectrum, you need to invest lots of computational time. For example, for this molecule, they uh, invested uh, time to calculate 45,000 grid points. Maybe they would love to do it more, but it's uh, already quite expensive. And they use lots of high level uh, uh, corrections. And uh, this uh, resulted in months of computational uh, uh, time uh, with QM methods uh, and uh, with machine learning, uh, we could reduce this obviously to seconds. Uh, so how to do it, uh, we use this uh, Craig model uh, developed uh, back in uh, 2017 already. So it's already quite some time ago. So again, you can see uh, Alec and Yurchenko from UCL. And uh, here, uh, this is kernel rich regression. So it's not neural networks, uh, which are very popular. Um, the kernel rich regression have advantages that you have analytical solution. Uh, to the uh, to obtain the parameters, and uh, in many cases it's uh, much more accurate and straightforward to, to use, and also faster to train for uh, small training sets. Um, now, in this uh, uh, molecule, it's also important to take into account the permutational invariance, uh, uh, and to do this, we used the permutationally invariant. Uh, uh, kernel. Uh, so another problem for very high accuracy uh, calculations uh, of potential energy su surfaces is that uh, machine learning is uh, very good for interpolation. Uh, so this is a very simple example, which uh, you can read uh, in the tutorial uh, uh, that uh, I written uh, for students. So this is uh, uh, H2 dissociation uh, curve. Uh, and uh, in this curve, you, you, these uh, circles represent training points. And uh, obviously, after you train machine learning on this, uh, you can almost exactly reproduce them and uh, even extrapolate for some points. Uh, but uh, then when machine learning doesn't know anything about uh, uh, the correct physical behavior, it uh, obviously cannot uh, describe it. Machine learning is still only a statistical model. Uh, so uh, we need to include this somehow information into the machine learning model, or we need to sample our points so that we cover these points. And uh, one of these uh, sampling procedures uh, is uh, structure-based sampling. So it's a kind of father's point sampling uh, based on geometries only. You don't need to uh, do it iteratively. So you don't need to train uh, your machine learning model iteratively. You don't need any a reference uh, QM data for this, uh, and uh, you can pick your training points already from uh, from the grid, uh, and uh, then after you train, all the remaining points lie somewhere in between or very close to to the training points, and uh, your interpolation becomes much more effective. So you avoid uh, extrapolation, and if you apply this uh, structure based approach, you can use. Uh, 10% uh, of the green points to train and then predict for the remaining points and uh, you save 90% of CPU time. And it's more accurate if you would use random sampling and uh, took 50% of points or half of points. So the wise selection of points is very important in machine learning. Uh, now for this uh, kind of uh, application, there are many corrections uh, which are very costly uh, computationally to generate. And that's why uh, it uh, makes more sense to, to use a kind of uh, delta learning uh, approach for each of these corrections. And then if you uh, add them all up, uh, you will get uh, 
uh, final hierarchical machine learning model, but the problem is now how to get the training sets for each model because we need to use as little as few points as possible, but we don't know beforehand uh, what would be the best, uh, what would be enough points uh, for this. So uh, I found that uh, for these uh, kind of uh, delta models, uh, uh, a very nice uh, uh, dependence uh, holds. So, so the ratio between predictions uh, for the same training uh, points for each of these uh, delta models uh, is roughly uh, constant and it's roughly the same as for, for the reference uh, uh, ratio between uh, 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 all of these corrections. And once you know this, you can solve optimization problem and get your uh, training number of training points for each of the delta models automatically. Uh, now, using this hierarchical machine learning approach, uh, uh, so kind of some of Delta machine learning models, you can say already 99% of time, and uh, it's even more accurate than the previous approach. Uh, now, uh, I will not, uh, so I don't have much time, and uh, it's not about really reactions, but uh, obviously there are photochemical reactions, uh, and uh, uh, to simulate photochemical reactions, uh, uh, you can use non adiabatic anxiety state dynamics. And one of the most popular approaches is the surface hopping dynamics, uh, which requires lots of calculations. So uh, when we started this project, uh, I was uh, discussing with Mario, yeah, how many usually chem calculations do you need for this? And uh, he says it's around 200,000 for a typical project. So obviously, if you put in into the machine learning model, this number of points, then we don't need to run uh, machine learning simulations at all. We can use just uh, QM to, to run the pure uh, dynamics, uh, so the pure uh, quantum mechanical dynamics. So our goal was to find uh, whether we can push this, uh, uh, whether we can get a reasonable result with very small number of points. And indeed, even with 1,000 points for very complicated, uh, 33 dimensional model, uh, we can get reasonable uh, prediction of uh, excited state lifetime. And uh, this is a curve for the population of the excited state. Uh, but uh, again, this is not a topic. So, and also one last uh, thing that uh, machine learning is so generic that it's, you cannot just, so you don't uh, need to use it just uh, for one property. You can apply the same model for learning several properties. And we exploited this fact to learn uh, also oscillator strands uh, and uh, uh, using uh, uh, this crack model, we could uh, simulate absorption spectra, uh, uh, employ a nuclear ensemble approach. And for this, we could train only on 100 uh, uh, re uh, reference points. Uh, uh, from Vigna distribution, and it was enough to generate much more accurate, uh, uh, much more precise spectrum than uh, uh, QM, than using uh, QM method. Uh, so this was done with by Baushini. So this is a chance also to highlight my uh, my group, which is a, a very young group. And uh, also this research is done with machine learning uh, 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 ML atom package uh, for atomistic simulations. So we try to make it as user friendly as possible, and uh, you can reproduce uh, uh, our results using this, uh, our published results using this package. Uh, uh, so, with this, I would like to thank all the collaborators uh, who uh, contributed to this for the last topic of an anxiety states. Now, we are very actively collaborate with Mario Barbati. Also, I mentioned uh, UCL. Uh, uh, people, Sergey, uh, Alec, uh, and uh, so thank you for your attention. Thanks, thanks a lot, Pablo. Thanks a lot for a very inspiring talk. So we have got uh, quite a bit, we've got about five, ten minutes for for questions. So if uh, you want, I mean, people in the audience, if you want to unmute yourself, or you can uh, you can type a message on the chat. Okay, so any question you have for, for Pablo? Any questions for Pablo? There is, I think, a message here. Okay, so we have a question from uh, 
Mofra. So you said you can apply the same model for the properties. So what about Raman or I infrared spectra? Yeah, right. So there are already many publications, uh, I think, about uh, uh, learning other uh, properties. Uh, and for infrared spectra, you also need to, to learn dipole moments. Uh, and uh, I think I saw Philip uh, Marketan here in the chats uh, somewhere. So he he did it uh, since 2015, or so quite quite early. Uh, so indeed, uh, there are already approaches uh, which are applicable to this. Also, uh, uh, there are approaches uh, which can use just uh, potential energy surface information, and uh, from dynamics uh, you can uh, simulate uh, air spectra and. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's uh, completely possible. You just uh, use it as you would use in a quantum chemis chemical approach. You substitute its kind of surrogate approach. You uh, generate training data from QM, and then you just uh, train uh, on these properties, uh, your models, and to use them instead of QM. Uh, okay, so we have another question from Gabriel Schleder. Uh, can you elaborate on the differences and advantages of using the Delta? learning compared to direct machine learning on your study? Yeah, so uh, this is a very good point. So obviously, if you want uh, very fast cal calculations and this is uh, your limitation, then you need to use direct uh, machine learning, right? Because uh, any delta learning approach would require some uh, uh, baseline method, uh, QM method, or uh, like, yeah, uh, so which is uh, still uh, much slower than machine learning. So if you cannot afford this, uh, then uh, you need direct machine learning. But if, uh, for example, some empirical method speed is uh, enough for you and uh, you, uh, uh, you don't uh, have this limitation, uh, then using some baseline method would be much better because uh, uh, it's uh, already uh, provides a very good estimate usually to, to the final uh, uh, level of zero. For example, the, the shape of the potential energy surface uh, uh, for dissociation curve of H2, for example, right? It would be similar as semi empirical method or uh, coupled cluster method. It doesn't really uh, differ qualitatively much. So the, the learning of differences will be much, much easier for machine learning. They will be much smoother. Uh, so if you can do delta learning, it's much better to, to use delta learning. Okay, do we have any other questions from uh, Pablo? I think there is one more. Oh, there, can you see? Oh, yes, you're right, from was the day. You see your approach in decreasing the number in the increasing number of training data better than using active learning based approaches? Yes, yeah, this is a, another good question. So it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's better or worse, it's uh, just different because uh, if you know your grid, uh, so you, you can use uh, this uh, uh, sampling. Uh, but if you don't know your points in beforehand uh, and you need to generate them, then uh, you should apply active learning. But maybe at the end, you can even combine them because uh, once you generate it many points, maybe some of them become redundant or, and then you can prune them. So I think we have a question from Rachel Crespotero. Mm -hmm. um, so she's complimenting on the nice talk and she's asking, what is the approach to obtain non adiabatic coupling in the surface opening simulations? Yeah, so uh, hi, Rach. Uh, so nice uh, <laughs> to get your question from you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, basically, I probably hidden this slide or, yeah, because I didn't have much time for it, but uh, can I unhide it somehow? Yeah, I can unhide it and now. So this is uh, this approach. So basically, you, you, you can generate your couplings uh, in your usual way. The problem is not with generated couplings, but with learning them because they are very, very narrow. And uh, also, they have this phase uh, problem. But once you know where your points are located with a high magnitude, you can learn them. And uh, 
So it's shown here how you can do it. But in principle, uh, there are already like approaches. Uh, also, active learning was shown to, to be able to do this. So the, there are published approaches uh, uh, that you can use machine learning to, to learn even such uh, narrow functions. Usually people uh, multiply by delta E by, by the gap, which makes it easier to learn. This is going to be the last question. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you test from Gabriel uh, Schleder? Did you test Delta learning starting from a bad initial reference? Uh, yeah, this is uh, so. There are some comparative studies. We also uh, looked at this, and even in our very first paper that uh, you can uh, see in like original Delta uh, learning paper. Uh, that uh, if you use better methods, then it's easier to learn that you, least, you need uh, less training points. So uh, yeah, you probably have to find some very, very bad uh, method which would uh, have nothing to do with like final accuracy to make it uh, worse to learn than, train, than direct uh, uh, approach. But uh, usually even like very bad uh, semi-empirical methods would still be a good uh, initial reference, I would say. And thanks a lot, Pablo, for the yes, very for inspiring talk. And uh, I think we can now move to the next speaker. So is Professor Teodoro Laino from the IBM Research Center in Zurich. And uh, so Teodoro, just to give a, bit, a brief bit of uh, Teodoro. So Teodoro is from Italy, where he completed his doctoral studies in the prestigious Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa under the supervision of Michele Paranello. Then he moved to, uh, to Zurich, uh, where he worked as a postdoc in the group of Professor Uter before joining IBM, the IBM Research Lab in Zurich again, as a dis where he is a distinguished research staff member and the manager of the Accelerated Discovery Lab. So today, he will present the use of artificial intelligence language models to treat further reaction prediction, photosynthesis, and the prediction of reaction synthesis procedures. Thanks a lot, Sodoro. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the very nice introduction and thanks for inviting me. Thanks also to Tilde that triggered uh, uh, the possibility uh, for me to be, to be here in this uh, uh, very nice event. Uh, exactly, so I'll, I'll change a little bit topic compared to the previous talk and I'll move uh, into uh, remaining uh, heavily into chemistry, organic chemistry, how we can use uh, uh, existing knowledge, existing data to build uh, a certain number of uh, uh, architectures, uh, solutions that can support uh, a digital uh, experience of the equivalent chemical lab. So before I'm moving into the details, I uh, just wanted to um, give a very, unrepresentative overview of uh, the place where we are. This is an exceptional sunny and blue sky day, uh, more or less like today. Uh, we are very close to Zurich. Uh, lab is uh, um, roughly 70 years old and uh, uh, we are actually uh, known for uh, activities on the scanning tunnel in microscope as well as on the uh, high temperature superconductivity. Um, also, another um, uh, words of caution, every time I may be talking in first person, but please refer always to the people that I'm representing in this slide. Um, all the work that I will be talking uh, is actually contribution of uh, uh, all the people, different people in the team. So uh, I'm just here uh, sticking my face to, to the topic. So what I want to cover today more in detail is actually how can we use artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, for uh, implementing those tasks that have been uh, uh, primarily uh, under uh, the um, uh, under the responsibility of uh, chemists. Uh, there is one thing that actually is very uh, well uh, recognized uh, is that organic chemistry has always been considered an art. You need uh, many decades of experience in order to gain uh, 
uh, that knowledge that then allows you to solve problems like designing a synthesis once you have uh, your target molecule. And uh, from the synthesis, even more tricky uh, to design the right experimental protocols, the right sequence of actions that are bringing you from uh, uh, an architectural design of uh, the type of operation that you want to do in the lab, all the way to uh, the final goal, which is the making up of a molecule. So today I will actually cover uh, a series of architecture that will guide you uh, exactly through these tasks. Uh, we will start first with the uh, forward reaction prediction, retrosynthesis, and then uh, uh, also the prediction of uh, uh, how you can predict a reaction protocol, experimental protocol, uh, providing an input uh, uh, a simple uh, chemical reaction. So that's, uh, that's more or less uh, what uh, I will do. We will start by looking into uh, the chemical knowledge. So how, uh, what type of knowledge we have been using uh, and also some very uh, shallow uh, detail about the, the, the type of models that we are using. I will apologize already now uh, for uh, the, the level of depth that I will go into, but 25 minutes are really a short time. So I'm rather interested to give you a broad spectrum uh, and then all the details. Uh, feel free to post your question uh, already now in the chat, if you want, we can go uh, in the five minutes or take it offline. So uh, by looking at the data, looking at the model, I would like to guide you through the concept of building a model that uh, based on data only, uh, knowledge containing data only, uh, guide you through the forward reaction prediction problem. Uh, the second one is the retrosynthetic problem. And we will see that these two problems are uh, two phases of the same coin. Um, so it's actually once you pose the first problem and you find the solution for the first problem, uh, it's pretty simple to work on the second one. Uh, then the conversion um, of uh, text into sequence of actions, which was propedeutical for building uh, a data set uh, that we used for uh, building uh, a train model that given a reaction in input can actually uh, generate a certain number uh, of experimental, uh, experimental steps. And then I will uh, give a little bit of overview because with AI, you can do even more. You can uh, even not, not only try to uh, bridge the gap uh, between uh, uh, what is normally considered the chemical knowledge acquired uh, through many years of experience, but you can also do tasks that are uh, very intensive from a human perspective. And so I will uh, very, show, very briefly show you how you can use uh, machine learning uh, and some of the pitfalls in machine learning for uh, curating data sets in an unassisted way. Uh, and the final part is one of the part that I, I I think he, I, I really like a lot, it's incredibly beautiful. You can uh, uh, actually take your uh, machine learning model and instead of using as a black box, you can really unbox them. You can open up and you can start uh, looking at the um, uh, numerical, uh, uh, numerical layout of the different, uh, different nodes inside the architecture. And when we did this type of exercise, we uh, actually realized uh, why this type of architectures are actually very good in learning chemistry. If we have time, I would like to cover very quickly something that uh, has been one of our key activities last year, merging all the machine learning, combining machine learning with automation hardware for running synthesis. Um, with little human intervention. So let's start very, very, since very, very early stage, I mean, from data. Uh, data is, of course, uh, one of the major concern, and there's no surprise that uh, uh, the vast majority of the works in the space of organic chemistry is actually, uh, has been increasing exponentially uh, since 2012. Uh, this was the year which for uh, chemoinformatics, it's a very important year. We had one work uh, made by Daniel Lowy, uh, where actually uh, a large set of patents uh, 
were used for extracting chemical information, chemical reaction. And so this provided really the very first public uh, data set that then uh, uh, has been acting as a very fertile soil where lots of uh, um, experiences have been done uh, on different type of architectures. So this is exactly the same data set that we have been using. There are different versions, of course, some that are publicly accessible, others that are uh, automatically curated by small companies and that are selling access to uh, this data set, um, this uh, automatically curated data set. Of course, I mean, the major goal is always the quality, the, uh, the quality uh, of the data set as a such. And that may be one of the big discriminators why uh, when you use a specific approaches, uh, those approaches may be successful or not. Uh, and even the, the level of success may strongly depend on uh, uh, how good is the quality of the data set. And we will see again uh, towards the end of this presentation, how you can uh, uh, build a system for uh, curating data set in an assisted way. So the data set of chemical reactions are nothing more than a large collection of uh, reactants, reagents, and products. Uh, they are normally represented in uh, a large number of uh, possible formats. We stick extensively on SMILE. Um, there is the possibility to use other uh, representation. Smiles are very effective. Uh, they provide a mapping between the diagrammatic representation, which is very keen to organic chemistry, uh, to uh, a representation which is uh, uh, completely based on uh, uh, alphanumerical characters, which instead is very good for uh, building solutions for exploring data sets uh, and so on. In general, uh, very, very um, uh, very appreciated by chemoinformaticians. And one of the things that we did, uh, we actually, uh, and this is the, the thing that is characterizing the entire work of, uh, of the group where I'm working on, uh, is exactly the concept of treating organic chemistry as a language. So there, is, there are different reasons why that's uh, a very interesting uh, concept. The very first one uh, is that, uh, uh, from a philosophical, philosophical perspective, if you talk with organic chemists, uh, and even if we don't have mathematical proofs about the existence of a coherent language in organic chemistry, everybody will tell you that for them, uh, speaking about chemical reaction has a very, um, very profound uh, uh, rationale. Uh, so there have been a certain number of efforts done in the last 50 years, initiated by Cori, to provide uh, uh, a very clear set of uh, uh, rationale behind chemical reactions. And if you wish, these rationale uh, are exactly the equivalent of a grammar. So in the hypothesis where there is a language and there is a grammar behind organic chemistry, uh, all the, the innovation that we are experiencing in the field of natural language processing should actually be incredibly useful to extract those uh, language concept from large data set of chemical reaction and learn uh, those concepts instead of learning the corresponding rules. So the second reason is actually uh, quite, uh, uh, a quite sort of parasitic reasons. If you look at the space of machine learning, uh, in general artificial intelligence, there are two domains that are exploding in the last year. The very first one is image, image processing. The other one is natural language processing. So we thought that uh, if we focus on applying natural language processing uh, technologies into the space of chemistry, and we are successful in building the right usage, we can take advantage of the progression in that field uh, in order to drive uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in a very effective way even the development of machine learning model in chemistry. And that's exactly uh, our, was our, our starting point back to 2017, 2018. Uh, in our context, we use SMILES, exactly as you see here. Every, every single bit of a SMILE is actually identifying a specific molecule. And we use SMILES uh, exactly like sentences in natural languages. 
So you could imagine atom as letters and molecule as uh, words in a sentence. And so if we start thinking of this parallelism, the next step is that we can start casting reaction prediction tasks where you have reactants, reagents that uh, are digested by uh, a certain architecture to uh, predict a product more like a translation task. And so if you make this assumption and this parallelism, suddenly you have a large number of neuronal machine translation architecture that you can effectively use for casting the problem uh, of forward reaction prediction. This is exactly uh, what we have been doing since the beginning. And uh, to date, um, this is still the most successful approach in terms of uh, uh, accuracy, prediction accuracy, reaching more than 90% uh, on uh, uh, standardized data sets. Few words about the architecture. The architecture that we are exploring, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you work with this parallelism, you can jump on every single bit of innovation which appears in the space of natural language processing. And this is what happened back to 2018 when uh, uh, one of my collaborators, Philip, uh, Philip Schwaller, actually had the idea to uh, move from uh, the architecture that we were using uh, up to that point, which was a sequence to sequence model with an attention layer uh, to another model, uh, which is actually called Transformer, was uh, announced uh, and presented in 2018 at the beginning of 2018, end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And the major difference compared to all the sequence to sequence with attention is that uh, in this specific type of architecture, you have essentially just only a stack of attention layers instead of uh, uh, the uh, corresponding sequence to sequence uh, neural network architecture. So since then, we have been uh, strongly focusing on uh, uh, the development of uh, a customized architecture, transformer architecture, which we call the molecular transformer. And all the results that you will see in the next slides are exactly based on the use of this architecture. There are a few things that are characterizing this work. The very first thing is that you don't have uh, uh, built-in chemical knowledge. You are not programming chemical reaction rules. Everything that is uh, um, characterizing the prediction of product given reactants and reagent is actually learned uh, by looking to a larger number of chemical reactions that have been extracted from patents. So we are talking about a data set of approximately 3 million. And uh, if you want, that's the equivalent of the work that has been done in the last uh, uh, 200 years where people have been collected data sets and then trying to build uh, rules uh, that were explaining uh, a collection of chemical reaction. Here we are not implementing those rules, but we want uh, the machine learning architecture to learn those rules uh, by looking uh, at the same large number of examples. So once we, we have uh, the forward reaction prediction, the next step, of course, for a digital experience of the equivalent of uh, uh, a chemical lab is the design of the AI-driven uh, retrosynthesis. Now, if you cast the forward reaction prediction task as uh, a translation task, so translating like from Italian to English, then suddenly the retrosynthesis, which is uh, given a product I want to uh, predict the most likely or the most effective precursor that I can use to uh, generate that, that target molecule is nothing more than a translation in the reverse order. So instead of translating from Italian to English is equivalent from, uh, to a translation from English to Italian. And that's exactly where the efficacy of casting uh, using natural language, the, 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 the similarity with natural language uh, is kicking in. You are very quickly uh, capable of training a retrosynthetic model uh, that by just swapping the order uh, of your uh, chemical reaction data. Instead of having reactants, reagents, and product, you can just use product, reactants, reagents, and you can train a model 
uh, that is uh, exactly the inverse of the forward reaction prediction model. That's the easy part, the AI part. Now, of course, from uh, an algorithmic perspective, uh, the entire retrosynthetic tree is something a little bit more complex. Uh, we always talk about retrosynthetic tree for one reason, because every time you are uh, decomposing and proposing a certain number of uh, starting material uh, that may produce uh, your molecule in one step, you will have to iterate this process. And so for as many child you have at the very first uh, recommendation, you are going to evolve the tree into uh, a tree which is highly complex. And so you will need to have uh, technologies and algorithms that are capable of exploring the tree in a very effective way. So there uh, we, we have been exploring uh, um, uh, pretty standard, so not uh, AI driven uh, technologies yet uh, for uh, exploring retrosynthetic tree that are built on the fly. Now, one of the complex things of building uh, a retrosynthetic tree on the fly is that you will have to decide in which direction you want to grow up your tree. And so there we actually decided to take advantage of uh, uh, the Bayesian uh, probability and we casted an estimator that is inspired by the Bayesian probability uh, that gives us at every time what is the, uh, where is the highest probability in expanding uh, a specific part of the tree uh, in reaching uh, commercially available products. And so that's exactly the, the entire mix up. You have uh, a single step retrosynthetic model, but you also have uh, um, um, a technology, classical technology for exploring hyper tree that are heavily driven by um, a, a scoring function that is uh, inspired by the Bayesian probability. You can use all these things. Uh, and that's something that also we are incredibly uh, uh, how to say, proud, but also we have lots of fun. Uh, we like to uh, wrap up all the technologies that we do in such a way that is consumable by, uh, by people uh, at different level. So we do have GitHubs where you can uh, access the core technologies, uh, but uh, quite often as uh, we try to uh, reach and also promote the use of AI in, uh, uh, in chemical labs, our first uh, uh, people that we like to talk to are also organic chemists that do not have necessarily a coding experience. And so we built all this technology into uh, a platform that uh, is relatively easy to use. And that's an example, for instance, of how it looks like a retrosynthetic uh, uh, design uh, of uh, a target molecule. So the second part in your uh, digital chemistry lab experience is the construction of uh, uh, the action. So now that you have a retrosynthetic tree, you would like to know what are the precise sequence of operations uh, that you have to follow in order to execute every single chemical reaction uh, in a chemical laboratory. So this is important for two reasons. The very first one is that uh, when you do this type of work in a chemical laboratory, if you are lucky and the reaction that you want to implement is already uh, reported in literature, you can just follow up the procedure that is presented in an article or in a patent. But if you are not lucky, this can be a very intensive task made up of lots of trial and errors, starting from solvents, starting to the fact that you didn't predict that there was a precipitation. Uh, and so you have really to intervene uh, more or less real time while you are executing a recipe to adjust the recipe and obtain your product. And so what we did, we started uh, by building a very first model uh, that uh, is uh, reading paragraph, complex paragraph uh, written by people, and is translating this paragraph in sequence of actions. Why is this important? It's important because there is to date uh, no uh, data set of available recipes, uh, coincise recipes or programs uh, that are actually useful for 
uh, implementing a synthesis. So, so for us, it was first and foremost a necessity to build a data set, which then we have been able to, be, to, to use to build a second model that given a chemical reaction is capable of predicting uh, the sequence of steps. But also, and this is actually a, a very interesting concept, you can use the same type of technology, which is purely natural language processing technology for taking this task, for taking this text and converting into a sequence of operations that then you can directly uh, convert into a program that can be executed by uh, automation hardware. So that's the, 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 the work that actually we refer as a paragraph to action. Uh, but this is the, actually the novelty in the entire ecosystem. Uh, once you have a data set of chemical reaction represented as a smiles together with uh, a sequence of actions, you can build a model that is capable of learning the features of the reaction smiles together with the sequence of operations. And then every time you are proposing uh, a new chemical reaction in input, this architecture is capable of generating from zero uh, the optimal uh, chemical, um, chemical protocol to execute in a laboratory. So that's uh, optimal, of course, uh, limited to uh, the space that has been used for training the architecture. That's, uh, that's of course, always very important to specify. And that's what we call smile to action. The smile to action is actually uh, capable of creating these chemical recipes. Uh, and if somebody is interested, even for using in your chemical laboratory, all these models are all freely uh, available uh, and usable uh, on the RxSend platform. So we had a look at the four first models. Uh, I will cover actually the last, uh, uh, the last two, leaving the prediction of the yield uh, outside. So um, how can you use uh, the technology of NLP for cleaning up a data set? And first of all, why it's important to cleaning up a data set? Because data set are automatically extracted. So there are a certain number of uh, programs. Some of them may be based on machine learning, but others are based on rules. Um, and uh, of course, there is an extraction error. So we are, we and everybody else working with this type of data set is perfectly aware of the fact that uh, uh, these data sets contain uh, lots of uh, uh, chemically meaning, uh, meaningless uh, uh, knowledge. And so how can you use uh, this technology for cleaning data set? Well, you can actually look at the frequency uh, for every single entry in the data set. When you train this model for learning the forward reaction prediction, you can look at the frequency for every single record of how many times that record is learned and forgotten during the training cycle. And so there are specific patterns that are identifying chemically wrong, uh, chemically meaningless entries. And the reason is that uh, if you have, uh, if all these entries would actually be chemically meaningful, they would all uh, um, be representative of a specific grammar that the system would be actually capable of learning. But as soon as you start introducing dialects or uh, things that are not anymore chemically correct, uh, you are introducing exception in the grammar. You are introducing slang, uh, slang in the language of chemistry. And so it's possible by using this information to uh, isolate those entries that have an highest uh, learning forgetting rate and uh, remove them from your training data set. At the same time, you can use the same technology for actually, and this is what I, I was mentioning uh, uh, at the beginning, you can use the same technology for opening up uh, the machine learning, the transformer, and looking at the weights of the, of the different attention layers. And you suddenly realize that there are specific attention layer that are automatically learning in an unsupervised way the uh, atom mapping. So the atom mapping is nothing more than the uh, entry room for the construction of uh, chemical reaction rules. And so this for us was really one of the biggest discovery because we managed really to understand that by learning how, 
atoms are mapped between reactants, reagents, and products, the reality is that these architectures are uh, learning uh, an intrinsic representation of the grammar uh, that in this case, in the context of organic chemistry, is nothing more than all the chemical reaction rules that are thought in uh, organic chemistry classes. So I think I'm already there, uh, so I want to stop it here. Uh, I want just to say 30 seconds uh, why this is also important, because once you have all these experience, these models, you can actually put the things together and you can uh, have AI programming existing hardware. And that's exactly what, uh, uh, what we did uh, um, last year, where we merged all these models that are doing chemical reaction prediction. And this is exactly what you can experience online in the platform. But we merged them with hardware, real hardware in the lab that is actually executing chemical reaction. So I want to leave you with uh, uh, actually one video that shows exactly uh, the synthesis of one molecule. In this case, we were working on a very simple uh, sulfonium ion. Uh, you are basically designing all the synthesis on the web and uh, uh, really in three clicks, you are capable of uh, uh, programming, converting all the prediction of the AI. So the sequence of operations that have been generated from the retrosynthesis and you are using all this uh, amount of information for actually programming an hardware that then is executing uh, the synthesis. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I will make the slides available if anybody is interested and there will be links uh, to papers and uh, material. Thank you so much. Many, many thanks Theodore for a very fascinating talk. I mean, it, show, it shows a completely new paradigm in terms of not just doing calculations, but also doing experiments. So, uh, so why would I wait for a few, I'm sure, I'm sure there are several questions from the audience, but I'd like to ask you if, you know, if any, any example in which, you know, uh, of, uh, regarding you, you mentioned at the end, you saw this video that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there is a particular component that's being synthesized using this procedure. Do you have any other examples from organic colleagues, organic chemistry colleagues that came to you and uh, asked you to use uh, your technology? To... I mean, internally we are, uh, we are actually using this system for a um, uh, few projects. Uh, so one of those, uh, uh, that specific sulfonium ion molecule is part of an effort to build a, a new photoacid generator for semiconductor patterning. Um, so there is lots of uh, uh, molecular design always using machine learning, which is uh, a topic that uh, we didn't even touch today. Uh, but then once you have this design, you have to be in the condition of making them. And so uh, one of the trends that, that appeared, uh, uh, I think in the last year, in the last 12 months, it became uh, pretty uh, standard practice, is the fact of including uh, uh, synthesizability uh, since the very early stages of the molecular design process. Um, this is one of those uh, uh, concepts which is uh, obvious to some extent, but also very important. Uh, it's uncountable the number of times that you have uh, uh, on uh, in silico very effective molecule, but then uh, that are impossible to be synthesized. So photoacid generator is, generator is once we are working on uh, a new amino alcohol for CO2 capturing. Uh, and as of now, we are uh, doing uh, a pretty nice work in the space of uh, um, uh, life science uh, inhibitor uh, of use specific receptor in the cell um, uh, design synthesis and testing. Uh, so there will be more news definitely in uh, uh, six to seven months. Thanks, Laura. So we have a we have a we have a. Uh, question on the chat so is quite long, so you can speak. Look at that. I, I will read it anyway. So thanks. For, it's from Vincent Chung. Thanks for the talk on extracting the actions of synthesis and using the data sets. How to deal with action values, temperature, for example, that are not the necessary conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I the think... boundary conditions are not known. Okay, so uh, Vincent, that's actually a very, very 
very interesting question. So what we did normally is that you have to uh, absorb that type of noise, which is intrinsic in the data. And so what we uh, opted for is actually beaming, beaming these values and assuming that within a certain number of beamings, uh, within a certain interval in these beamings, uh, the effectiveness of a chemical procedure uh, doesn't really change. So nothing really fancy. Uh, that's for temperature. Uh, I think with binning, you can more or less go to the numbers that you were reporting in the question. But if you look at the timing, uh, execution time of chemical reaction, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting concept because uh, the number of times that procedures are reported with uh, the statement was run overnight, uh, it's uncountable. Uh, and not because the reaction really was needing uh, uh, 12 or 15 hours, but because quite often the person that was running the reaction uh, was more pointing towards home than staying there and monitoring the reaction. So we decided for timing, uh, execution timing of chemical reaction to go very coarse, uh, very, uh, very broad range intervals. And so we have uh, reaction that are reported in less than one or two hours, reaction from one to two hours to uh, six, 10 hours, and then reaction of 24 hours. Well, we, thanks a lot, Theodore. We have a lot of questions. I will, don't have time to go through all them. So we'll just go to the first one. I think it's from Isham Ati. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. When combining multiple artificial, artificial intelligence models from retrosynthesis to action extraction, how do you account for error accumulation at each step? Does the error accumulation become significant? Significant. Does the error accumulation become significant? That's an interesting one. So I don't have an answer to be honest. I mean, but for sure you will have. Uh, uh, so one of the things that we normally do, and I know that this is actually by far. Uh, not answering this question. Eh? Uh, but one of the things that we do, we try to always uh, choose in all the procedures that are executed. Now I I'm focusing on uh, using uh, the entire chain of prediction in a real lab experiment. We try to use prediction that have a very high uh, likelihood, uh, very high um, uh, prediction confidence. And this holds of course for the retrosynthesis but in general, it holds also for all the other steps. So uh, at, from that perspective, we try to keep uh, uh, the prediction score pretty high across the entire chain. But I think the final question for answering that uh, is going really to have uh, uh, results on a large number of chemical reactions. Uh, and I think I will be able to answer uh, as soon as we are submitting uh, one of the main paper that is gathering all these things together. So in a month, a month and a half, where we have uh, 30 approaches and for the 30 approaches, we are really looking at the details uh, of the difference in the different prediction steps. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks a lot, Teodoro. So we have got more questions. However, you know, in normal situation, I would say, yeah, you know, please uh, have a chat with Teodoro during the coffee break, but uh, I would probably, I don't know the current system stuff, so just send an email to Teodoro. But thanks a lot for your for, no uh, for, for I, your I'll time. reply as much as possible on the chat now. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Teodoro. So now we are going to our third speaker. So it's Luca Giringelli. So Luca, just a brief bio on Luca. And Luca is a lead, who is currently leading the group Big Data Analytics for Materials Science. Uh, in the novel material discovery laboratory at Fritz Haber Institute in Berlin. So Luca as well is Italian and he graduated from Politecnico di Milano. And then he moved to Amsterdam where he completed the PhD under the supervision of Professor Dan Franke. And since 2008, he has been wor working at the, uh, the Fritz Haber Institute in Berlin, where he currently holds the position of a group leader in the NOMAD projects. And in particular, he leads the development of uh, machine learning methods for modeling for the modeling of big data in material science. And uh, today we'll present us the application of such techniques to heterogeneous catalysis. So the floor is yours, Luca. Thanks again for uh, joining this symposium. 
Uh, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Luca. Okay. Okay. Good. So um, uh, I will start with a, a little bit of uh, uh, framing uh, the, the theoretical methods that I, I will talk about. So I'm mainly a method developer, and even though I chose uh, uh, two notable examples of application, uh, what I care today to communicate is more about uh, uh, methods uh, in artificial intelligence that are a little bit uh, less usual, uh, let's say. And so there was this uh, kind of strange word, of, uh, probably in the in the title, uh, this uh, this uh, symbolic inference. That let me frame it in the in the general context of artificial intelligence. That is uh, uh, the, the, the the discipline that includes algorithm mimicking in general human intelligence, uh, and not necessarily learning. A kind of subset of artificial intelligence is machine learning, uh, that has uh, the the. the common trait to, to, have, uh, to develop uh, uh, algorithms that, that do learn, so they, they necessarily improve with, with more data. And in general, uh, it, it's the realm of regularized regression, or uh, we have seen an example of kernel regression in the first talk. Um, a, a subset of this uh, is uh, what people more recently call representation learning. So these are uh, machine learning algorithms that learn uh, the representation together with the, with the model uh, that they predict. Um, and uh, probably the most notable example in this set is, uh, is deep learning, uh, but uh, symbolic inference is part of also of this, uh, of this subset. Um, in general, so uh, inference uh, stays for uh, learning from data, so good old uh, learning from data. And, uh, and the symbolic is, is uh, uh, framing a model in terms of analytic equations. So uh, in the inf symbolic inference is learning explanatory equation from data. Uh, it has many advantages. Uh, uh, one is this fact that the, uh, the equations can be read and, and analyzed, so they, they, uh, they become easily explanatory. Um, and also that in general, uh, it works with very few data points and you will see an example in which data points are really, really uh, very few. Um, so uh, part of this, uh, of this uh, approach, symbolic inference uh, is uh, uh, symbolic regression. Uh, that is the, the first example that we show. Uh, classification is uh, kind of uh, akin to, to regression and uh, a, a much more uh, esoteric uh, approach that is uh, symbolic descriptive rules learning uh, uh, that uh, today I will talk about in the second part. So this is called subgroup discovery. You will see that is a very unusual artificial intelligence technique. Um, so let, let, let me go to the uh, general uh, frame uh, of the applications that, that uh, I will be talking about, uh, heterogeneous catalysis, that is of course, uh, uh, the hallmark of, of uh, uh, kind of across the scale, multi-scale uh, um, kind of phenomenon uh, uh, in the sense that uh, you have uh, uh, complex surface reaction networks. Uh, the catalyst is a structuring under reaction, so it's typically not the same uh, thing that has been put initially in, 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 the, in the chemical reactor. And, uh, and then you have uh, uh, a whole time scale uh, and, and, and Length scale transport of reactants and product from the surface sites, uh, plus all, all the above, uh, uh, can in principle uh, be uh, decoupled. Now, I will focus on a specific uh, example of uh, selective uh, CO3 oxidation. And this is a project uh, uh, that has been uh, uh, developed uh, in collaboration with the inorganic uh, uh, chemistry department at the, at the Fritz Haber. Um, and the and the, the Bascat uh, lab that is in turn a joint lab of the uh, BSF uh, company and uh, uh, the UNICAT uh, uh, Center of Excellence um, uh, in, uh, in Germany. Um, so this uh, this reaction, uh, uh, the, the idea is is to transform uh, 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 propane in uh, in in some uh, chemical that are useful useful avoiding the trap to, to produce uh, CO2. So this is the, the selectivity. Now I talked about complex uh, reaction network. This is uh, at least what uh, in the uh, department of uh, Schlegel has reconstructed uh, as the possible uh, complete network of reaction happening. 
you can recognize uh, the, the simple element that uh, I have isolated here. Um, and, and this is what we, we wanted to study. So the approach that we wanted to use is not to try and follow the whole uh, uh, reaction network and uh, uh, possibly find uh, alternative routes and, and, and uh, ideas for, for other chemical reactions, but to understand uh, what is happening in specific reaction that do happen in, uh, in, uh, um, in the reactor. And, um, and, and understand what uh, materials properties determine this, uh, this uh, reaction, and in particular, some uh, indicators of these reactions. And uh, probably uh, with the ultimate goal to, to suggest uh, uh, better materials for uh, as catalyst. So we started with um, um, nine uh, materials that have been characterized in the group of, uh, of Robert Schlegel. Um, and, and this is our uh, data set. So when I say few data points, I really mean uh, we can deal with few data points, uh, even though there is a trick uh, that I will talk about in, in a few seconds. Um, and, uh, and these are these uh, bunch of uh, vanadium-based uh, catalysts that were uh, prepared. And there is a, a long story behind these uh, in the department of, uh, of Robert Schlegel. They, uh, uh, devise the rules for, for uh, good practice for characterizing material for, for chemical reaction, uh, yielding to a so-called handbook that was uh, proposed recently. It's in a publication uh, end of last year. Uh, so these uh, nine material have been characterized as uh, very few other materials have been characterized in the uh, history of inorganic chemistry, I would say. Um, and this is our uh, starting point. So we uh, have uh, information on the material. This is all experimental. In this first application, I have no theoretical data. The theory comes only in the artificial intelligence, uh, trying to understand what's going on. And uh, so we have information about the flash catalyst, the uh, activated catalyst in the, in the, in the reaction. And, uh, and we have a, a, a number of, uh, of different uh, characterization that we have for the material uh, before, during, and after the, uh, the chemical reaction uh, occurred, uh, putting together uh, uh, a number of, uh, of uh, features that are candidate uh, to explain what's going on in, in the chemical reaction. Now, today I will talk about only one specific uh, um, figure of merit, uh, in particular the selectivity for the production of one particular molecule, uh, um, but they, they, they have already tried other, other, other features, uh, uh, other, other properties um, uh, that, that the methodology applies uh, more or less in the same way. So what is the methodology that, that we use? Uh, it's a combination of symbolic regression and compressed sensing. So the idea is that we write any property that we are interested in as a, um, expansion over, over a basis set, and I will come to the basis set in a second, and we want to um, uh, express it as a, as a sparse uh, um, expansion, so where only few of the expansion coefficients are different from zero. So mathematically, this is framed uh, in, in terms of this regularized regression, where the regularization is uh, the so-called L0 norm, so that is the number of non-zero uh, coefficients in this, uh, in this expansion itself. And uh, a bit uh, uh, graphically, this can be understood as a, as a selection uh, operation. So we have a, a, a matrix uh, operation here in which only few of the uh, unknown coefficients are different from zero. What they do is uh, effectively pick up uh, uh, basis functions in order to represent uh, our property. The basis functions are constructed starting from our candidates. So we group them by, by uh, physical uh, dimensions, if they are length, energy, and so on. And then we construct these expressions uh, with this uh, tree representation that uh, is very handy because it, it makes uh, us uh, make the, the, the complexity uh, under control by, by applying uh, iteratively uh, operators in this uh, kind of regression tree. Sorry, symbolic tree. Um, now, essentially, this is almost all I am saying about the method. Uh, we have a nice tutorial uh, in terms of, of a Jupyter notebook in which you can follow all the steps uh, uh, that I, I, I kind of refer you in order to, to learn more. 
I want just to say that uh, uh, the, the complexity of the models uh, is, uh, is also something that you can uh, uh, deduce uh, from, from the data themselves or actually infer from the data themselves uh, by some uh, specific cross-validation uh, strategy. So the, uh, the point uh, uh, today is, is, uh, is already a step ahead. We need a, a, a kind of uh, upgrade of the method that is called uh, multitask uh, learning. So the multitask variant of, uh, of our approach. And, uh, and this is, uh, uh, in, in this way, we, we uh, calculate different properties at the same time with the idea uh, that we have the same descriptor that is selected for all the properties and the coefficients can be different from uh, each of the property. Now, in this specific example that we showed today, the, the different properties will be actually the same property at different temperatures. So this, this uh, framework is very, very flexible in order to, to apply the, uh, the methodology. And this can be seen as, uh, again, the selection operation where for each property, the, uh, the columns, the, the, the basis function that are selected are always the same. And we adapt the, the fitting coefficients to uh, the uh, property uh, that, that, that we want to. Now, this property can be somewhat uh, homogeneous and we can calculate the property one and two uh, and they impose that there is the same descriptor, but then we can also have that the, these properties are, are, are somewhat connected in, in some uh, symbolic way so that there is actually a parameter running uh, across the properties that I name here X. And so this, the coefficients of the expansion are actually a function of this parameter that is running. Now I already uh, revealed that uh, what we have been looking in a couple of slides would be temperature. And indeed uh, uh, we can have the different properties as a function of temperature uh, changing uh, while the descriptor uh, uh, so the, the kind of core of the model remain the same at all temperatures. And this is something uh, interesting because we can uh, uh, then collect the data that we have uh, for uh, the, uh, this, this kind of um, uh, reaction. And in particular here, I'm looking at the selectivity of the production of acrylic acid in the, uh, on, this, uh, on these materials. And we have uh, different uh, uh, trends at different temperatures uh, for the different materials. Some stay very low at all temperatures, some are quite high at, uh, at, at the temperature, but with a very marked peaks. Some are decreasing the temperature and some are very complicated uh, intermediate uh, behavior. And okay, so the, the modeling is able to, uh, to track uh, all, all this is what happening. Um, and we have a model that is two-dimensional uh, with a two-dimensional descriptor and uh, the, the expansion coefficients that are a function of, uh, of the temperature. Now, if we look at the expansion coefficient, uh, we find it actually uh, behaves quite, uh, both behave quite smoothly uh, as a function of temperature. So of course, if we had put any uh, random property uh, in, in the sequence, uh, this may not be the case, but here, since that we have the temperature, uh, uh, and, and we impose that the underlying physics is the same by imposing that there is the same descriptor. It turns out that the, 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 the coefficients that are learned each of uh, them uh, independently uh, change smoothly with the with temperature. Okay, so um, uh, with this model, we can uh, start making prediction then. So uh, we have, uh, this is uh, our descriptor uh, expanded. And we have the two-dimensional map in which we, we can uh, look at the selectivity of uh, possibly unknown materials. Uh, and this would be at a single temperature. And in order to look at what happens at different temperature that might be more interesting, uh, so by noticing that uh, here the, all the data points fall more or less on a, on a line on this, on this graph. And then we look at the kind of uh, uh, projection on, the, on, on a plane perpendicular to this one. Um, we, we look at the uh, uh, descriptor versus temperature dependence. So now each material that we have in the, in the data set is, is a straight line, but we have the temperature dependence. So you could still recognize, for example, this guy here is this guy here, uh, and you could recognize uh, in, the, in the column at the profile here. Um, and this is a, a, a kind of presentation that allows us to uh, uh, think how to, to find new materials. First of all, let's have a look to the, to the descriptor that is found, because this is one of the great uh, advantage of using this, uh, this technology. That is, uh, we have a, a symbolic expression 
um, that depends on some of the features. So I said uh, we had like 49 features we started off uh, from, and these five were selected, and they turned out to be uh, a, a, a combination of features that uh, uh, work at different scales. So like the poor volume is something that uh, that uh, uh, work at this uh, on, 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 the, on the transport kind of um, uh, phenomena related uh, issues and uh, and the other are uh, specifically uh, electronic properties of uh, of the materials and uh, and so on um, so we could focus on on specific uh, uh, elements of this uh, of this descriptor of which we know exactly the function of form and and try and improve the new material so here we I have not yet produced a new material, so this is purely speculative at the moment. But let's say if we can produce a material starting from this uh, uh, vanadyl uh, pyrophore state and increase its uh, its pore size uh, at the same time, decrease uh, uh, this uh, uh, activation energies of, of bulk con conductivity. Uh, we can uh, uh, step up to a material that has, uh, in general, a higher selectivity, and in particular has uh, some maximum somewhere here. And um, and one can say that so this, these two uh, properties uh, works at two completely different scales. So it's conceivable that one can change uh, them uh, independently. And actually, people have been trying to change the pore size previously. It's something that one can do by not changing the underlying uh, electronic property. So let me move um, now to the uh, other approach. Uh, I will start first introducing uh, uh, the methodology and then uh, I will introduce uh, the, uh, the actual example that is also in the realm of uh, heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, kind of um, exotic uh, approach is called the subgroup discovery. And differently from uh, uh, more mainstream uh, artificial intelligence approaches, approaches it doesn't uh, predict uh, uh, points. So it's not a regression or a classification uh, kind of approach. It's more like a descriptive approach. It tells us the structure of the data. So we start from, uh, from population and, and some target property uh, and, and, and some, uh, some uh, features uh, uh, or candidate descriptors that we have. And here I start with a very simplified cartoon in order to try and elucidate what's going on. So let's say that we have only one dimensional descriptor and, and, and a property that we're interested in, and we have these uh, data points that are quite uh, apparently scattered. So predicting or, or saying that D1 contains uh, important information about property is, is a little bit uh, far-fetched. Uh, one can do the usual machine learning here and say, okay, I have some prediction that one may be uh, happy or not, but one can do much more. And, and notice, for example, that there is a, a subset of points uh, for which the relationship between the descriptor and property is particularly simple. Uh, actually, it's, it's constant. And so if we could identify this subset of points uh, automatically, we would have a very simple model going from the descriptor to the property. Now, um, I didn't say anything uh, so far about the circles and the squares. Let's say that there is another categorical descriptor uh, that we know of. And now we notice that uh, if uh, 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 data point is a circle and it, its value is above a certain threshold. Also, we have a particularly uh, simple uh, relationship between uh, the descriptor and the property. So uh, subgroup discovery is trying to do this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, game uh, uh, in, uh, in high dimension. So find uh, uh, partitioning of the, of the data set in terms of the candidate uh, uh, descriptor um, uh, so that uh, the, the isolated subgroup has exceptional property with respect to our um, uh, uh, property of interest um, uh, compared to the, to the whole population. Uh, let me move to the, to the application. What we were interested in uh, uh, is the um, transformation uh, of, uh, of, uh, of CO2. Uh, into some useful, I say, uh, fuels or, or in general chemicals. And this was uh, originally a, a nomad project uh, and now includes uh, a bit more, uh, more collaborators, mainly because the people that were uh, originally in the nomad project had then moved on. So we have a Skoltec Institute uh, in, 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 
in Moscow and, uh, and again uh, the, the, the Unicat, you know, after the Basca. Um, and uh, so we want to, to find good catalysts for, uh, for this uh, uh, CO2 conversion. And uh, so here we produced uh, a, a large data set uh, uh, for, uh, of, of oxide surfaces with different uh, uh, absorption sites. And so we're interested that, of course, the CO2 absorption and, and its activation. So the idea is, uh, is to find uh, uh, what materials uh, are catalytically active, but not, uh, let's say, directly. I will come in a second to what I mean. What we want to actually, uh, so the actual question we, we, we ask is uh, what is uh, the most informative indicator of CO2 activation? So if there is anything in, in the CO2 molecule uh, absorption and, and further and, and then the relaxation of the surface after the, the absorption, uh, that indicates uh, that there is uh, uh, a propensity for the material to be a good catalyst. And next we want to know if there is a way to predict uh, this uh, uh, activation uh, uh, indicator, uh, because we maybe would like to uh, predict it without uh, doing the actual absorption of the molecule on top of the, uh, the surface. So um, the motivation of these uh, 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 questions uh, is uh, from uh, the observation uh, uh, that in the gas phase, uh, uh, of course, uh, if, you, if you bend the CO2 molecule, you activate it in the sense if you make it uh, prone to, to uh, uh, undergo uh, chemical reactions with uh, some other reactants. And in, in specifically in the gas phase, uh, the, the bending of the molecule and the uh, uh, kind of elongation of the uh, CO chemical bonds uh, is strictly correlated. And actually the driving force would be um, uh, the um, charge uh, or the partial charge on the molecule. So you make the, the, the molecule uh, artificially uh, negative. I mean, this is a calculation, of course, and then you will get it uh, more and more bent uh, and, and the uh, CO bonds will, uh, will elongate, so they become weaker and weaker. But if you stick this, uh, uh, the, the CO2 molecule on the surface, this uh, uh, strict correlation is lost. And these are the data points that we have calculated and I come uh, uh, in a few slides uh, what the blue and the green means, but just look at the black data points in which we see that there is, yes, a mainstream uh, of, of the uh, uh, data such that they, they follow more or less uh, uh, unperturbed the uh, uh, gas phase trend, but there are a lot of uh, uh, outliers and we would like to understand if these outliers are special in terms of, uh, of catalysis. So let me, I frame it a bit better now that I've introduced the motivation, what uh, uh, we are after and, uh, and how we structure the, uh, the investigation. So we start from uh, uh, descriptors. So these are properties of uh, the atoms constituting the materials, uh, the uh, bulk uh, material, so without including the uh, surface properties and properties of the pristine surface. So these are all properties that do not um, include uh, uh, information uh, about the uh, uh, molecule absorbed on the surface uh, and, and, and the reconstruction that is induced by, by this, uh, uh, the possible reconstruction that is induced by this uh, absorption. So they are somewhat relatively cheap uh, uh, numbers to obtain uh, with some calculations. And then we apply the subgroup discovery onto some uh, selected properties like this uh, OCO bending angle or the uh, uh, bond length of uh, the, the CO and the, the CO2 molecule. And we would like to see if we notice something unusual in the distribution of these properties. Uh, and that could be explained by means of some of these uh, descriptors here. So all this is completely isolated from the knowledge whether the material is or not a good catalyst. So that's why I call this unsupervised learning in the sense that we don't supervise this uh, uh, learning here by using the information whether the material is catalyst or not. We just look for unusual uh, um, trends or, or, uh, or, uh, or set of properties in the, in the, in the uh, overall set of, uh, set of materials. 
to do that, we have to uh, construct properly uh, the, uh, the utility function that the subgroup discovery is actually optimizing. So uh, this whole uh, story is related to uh, being able to frame in a mathematical sense um, uh, what we are actually looking for. So here we are looking for uh, uh, absorption sites such that uh, the CO2 molecule is, for example, uh, particularly bent, or the CO bond is particularly elongated. We also analyze other target properties, but I will not talk about them uh, today. Um, so we want that the subset of these uh, materials that, or, or absorption site that we select uh, is not that small, uh, because otherwise we are particularizing too much to very few data points and the thing might be not interesting. Um, and, and, uh, and then we want to uh, kind of uh, optimize this difference uh, uh, from, from the gas phase. Uh, and then we also look into whether we uh, want to restrain the values of absorption energies. And, and the motivation of this is related to the, uh, to the so-called Sabatier principle. So uh, it's, a, it's a known principle in catalysis that says that, of course, uh, the molecule, uh, in order to be activated and, and be prone to, to, to undergo uh, further reaction, uh, should not uh, uh, should, should, should be uh, absorbed strongly on the surface, but not too strongly. Otherwise, uh, it could uh, completely dissociate and actually poison the surface. So there should be uh, an activation of the molecule, but uh, uh, the molecule should be able to leave the surface at some point after after it, it has been uh, uh, undergone reaction. And so we would like to see if we can, uh, if uh, this uh, uh, imposing energy constraint is, uh, is important or not. So mathematically, this is mapped here, but I, I will actually skip the analysis of the formula at, the, at this stage in order to present it to be the results. So this is the, the, the full distribution of absorption energies actually. Um, and we look, and we found so the, the subgroup discovery found a subgroup uh, uh, when we uh, select the uh, OCO angle as, as as our target property, and we are looking for particularly bent molecule, and we see that there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, materials properties that do determine uh, belonging to this particularly bent structure that uh, altogether can be correlated with uh, a strong bonding with charge transfer from uh, the carbon atom to the uh, surface oxygen. Um, and you see that this uh, particularly bent uh, molecule also are very strongly bonded to the, uh, bonded to the, to the surface. Now, another, uh, so when we change the property and we go to the elongation of the CO bond, we find that, that there is another mechanism. So the actually uh, the C uh, atom bonds on the, on the oxygen, but also one of the oxygen uh, uh, interacts covalently with, the, with one of the cations uh, on, on the surface. And this leads to a, a, a weaker overall bonding of the surface uh, uh, with a marked uh, elongation of the bond that is not involved, uh, the CO bond that is not involved uh, uh, with the bonding with, with the surface. So there is this CO bond that is weakened, and this is the one that is prone to undergo chemical reaction. So this, uh, the methodology has, has discovered the subgroup and characterized it, uh, that, that uh, uh, seems to already sit in the, in the, in the uh, Goldilocks area of, uh, of the Sabatier principle, so that uh, the, the, the absorption energy is, uh, is satisfactory. Indeed, if we impose that we want molecules that are uh, not too much uh, bonded to the surface, the uh, uh, particularly bent OCO subgroup moves to uh, uh, higher energies, while the, the uh, subgroup uh, uh, associated with the uh, large uh, CO elongations uh, uh, essentially does not change. So uh, this, this uh, subgroup here uh, contains already the uh, important information about uh, uh, the activation of the molecule. So the conclusion here is that uh, this uh, uh, large LCO, uh, so long uh, strengthening, of, uh, elongation of the bond uh, is, is a better indicator of the, uh, uh, of the catalytic uh, 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 propensity of the material. Actually, the conclusion follows from, from, from uh, the analysis of now the, 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 the data that we have about whether the material is or not a good catalyst. And it turns out that indeed material falling in this uh, green group, uh, they are uh, uh, 
there are several materials that are known to be a good uh, catalyst. And, and while uh, all those that are known to be uh, bad uh, do not uh, uh, belong to this, uh, to this uh, uh, group. So uh, the, the, this methodology is, uh, is giving an, an incredible insight and makes the prediction in terms of uh, properties of the, uh, say, the pristine surface. Uh, so without including the uh, CO2 uh, assumption. Um, this is uh, what I wanted to cover today. Um, uh, I leave the, uh, the names of the, uh, of the collaborator, uh, although I like particular Lucas Popa that did most of the work on the scientific tree oxidation and Alexei Mosaica, that I think I've seen uh, among in the audience. Um, for the uh, CO2 uh, activation. Uh, and I thank you for uh, your attention. Silence. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> There's always this moment oh. in which I think uh, I was not online thanks, anymore. Th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Luca. Thanks a lot, Luca, for the very informative talk. Uh, Okay, I have, I have a question, but first I could like, there is a, a question from Jose Coneza. He's asking, uh, in heterogeneous catalysis, an important aspect is the activation by coke deposition, decrease of surface area, etc. This feature should be considered, you know, how can, can you, cons how could you consider this feature in, uh, in a machine learning approach? Uh, I, I lost what feature, sorry. I, I, I just didn't hear what, what feature, yes. what, what is the... So the question is from, uh, uh, is uh, in heterogeneous catalysis, an important aspect is the activation. activation. Uh, by coke deposition, the crease of surface area. Surface area. And uh, he say in his comment that this feature should be also considered in any machine learning approach. So uh, it's, I would like to know if you can comment on, on this question. So, yeah. So, uh... If I understand correctly, uh, so it, it can certainly uh, be, be considered. One has to see on, on which side. So if it's something that you want to predict or if it's something that you want to, to include as an information for doing the learning. Uh, here, um, what, what I try to show uh, is that we can set a, a, a set of properties that we call features or, or candidate descriptors and, and, and a set of properties that we want to predict. And uh, if we are after some, uh, um, uh, yeah, selectivity of yield of our, or our reaction. We can plug in information uh, on the on the pristine material, but also information on the uh, activated material and so on. So, in uh, in the first example uh, where we had only experimental data, uh, for sure we have in, in, in included uh, information about the uh, uh, activated material. In in the second example, we use only theoretical information on, on the ideal pristine uh, uh, material. Uh, so the uh, the general idea is that uh, if you have enough information with the simplest possible set of uh, features, uh, then uh, then uh, that, that's the, the, the best game, right? Because you, you, you can make a prediction on the basis of uh, the cheapest possible information. If you see that this is not enough, and you will see because you don't get predictions that are reliable, uh, then you should step up with complexity and give more and more complex uh, uh, properties in order to predict your uh, property of interest. I hope this addressed a bit the question. Yeah, no, I think I understand. Well, yeah. So, uh, and, and for example, suppose that you want so, so you are saying essentially you start from a very large, large uh, set of, uh, for example, I see that you were using uh, in the, your first example, you you use 49 Barking surface properties. In your second example, you use 46, 46 uh, bark and uh, properties in the case of CO2 activation. And you use two proper to um, uh, say output property to see if there was activation of CO2. What about if you want to extend the type of properties that uh, in the case of CO2 activation that you want to look at, can you do that easily? Is it the framework, is it the framework robust or to do that? Because so for example, for CO2, CO2 activation, yes, usually people look at the CO2 bonding as a way to see that the CO2 is actually starting to break, but sometimes no. it's not always the case. That, that, so that's if you want correct. to extend, so we, we can. Sorry, I'm switching on the light because I see that in Berlin we are getting to <laughs> the evening. Uh, so, 
uh, we can extend uh, the number of features. Um, so from the point of view of the robustness of the algorithm, this is uh, one of the main features of the algorithm. Uh, everything that matters will be selected and everything that doesn't matter will be completely ignored without polluting anything else because it, it's, uh, the, the, this is where the compressed sensing is operating, especially in the, the first that I explained. The second one is not specifically compressed sensing, but it does also this selection. So whatever does not matter will not be selected. Of course, there is a computational cost in order to screen all these features. So this is where we, one may need some kind of pre-screening of the features. Uh, uh, if you have really a lot, like uh, hundreds of features. So in principle, so it's not a robustness problem, it's a computational problem at some point because you have to construct all combinations and, uh, and it can become uh, heavy, but uh, we are working. Uh, so this is of course one uh, <laughs> uh, problem yeah. that, that, that we, we, we faced and, and we have uh, worked on a few strategies for, uh, for uh, pre-screen uh, and yeah. Not, not, not yet finalized, but it will be something soon. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Do do we have any other questions for uh, for Luca? That you, if you want to type any questions, please please type I them type them on the chat. Oh, no. okay. oh yes. So Gabriel Schleder, in your opinion, when should you apply subgroup discovery instead of multitask, for instance? So it really depends on, on the uh, answer you're trying to, uh, so the question you're trying to answer, sorry. Uh, the, the, the multitask learning uh, is a predictive uh, kind of uh, strategy. So you will uh, uh, get a, a predictive model that will tell you this property will have such and such value as a function of some input property. Uh, the start to discovery is, is really explorative. So it tells you what is unusual in the data and it focuses on, uh, on the, uh, in a way, the outliers in the sense, uh, uh, so what, what I showed uh, that, that, that there is the main group of, of, uh, of assertion size that, that behave almost as gas phase. This is actually not interesting for catalysis. Uh, the subgroup discovery is immediately jumping to those that are unusual and, 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 and uh, signals them. But then it is more like, the experience of the uh, yeah, chemists, physicists, whatever that, that uh, go, goes farther. So you get an indication and you get, uh, 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 how to say, um, uh, a description in terms of the features that you have uh, plugged in, uh, that you have proposed actually, not plugged in. Um, uh, but, but in order to interpret, and, and so what I sh I've shown is already the interpretation of, uh, of the results, uh, requires uh, your domain expertise in the sense that you would get uh, something about the work function, something about the distance of uh, some angle, some, some, some atoms on the surface, and then you think about uh, and, and you come up with the, with the explanation why this has happened. But uh, the method is telling you where to focus your attention out of tens, if not hundreds of possible candidates. So uh, my idea here is that uh, these methods are a, a, a aid to, uh, um, to, the, to the researcher, rather right? they're just giving you a good prediction, but you have no idea what's, what, what has gone on in order to get this good prediction, right? So this is a, a kind of alternative approach. Thanks, Luca. Okay, if you, okay, okay so it's Ms. is thanking you. So have you, have you got any other questions for, uh, for, for Luca? Otherwise, I think we should uh, uh, thank our three speakers, Luca, Teodoro, and Pablo. Thanks also, Pablo, for staying so late. I know that in China City it's probably now 12 o'clock. So thanks a lot thank for Thank you for interesting for talks also. It was interesting to listen. <laughs> and uh, so we can close the session and uh, and again, uh, thanks a lot for uh, also for the others. We have at certain point we had about 160 people joining, so that I think was a, a, an excellent attendance. And uh, well, thanks a lot again, and I wish you a good evening or good night, probably. And uh, I see you hopefully in person sometimes in the near future. Yes, yeah, see you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thanks. Ciao, ciao.